Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Families First, a Palm Beach School District update. We have muted all participant devices to eliminate background noise so everyone can hear clearly. The view options on your screen can be adjusted by di to display all panelists by navigating to the view options on the toolbar. Select side by side for optimal view. Feel free to submit questions at any time by navigating to the Q&A option on the toolbar. Instructions on how to submit a question are being displayed on the screen. The live Q&A portion of the webinar will begin at the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you again for tuning in for today's webinar, and I would now like to pass it off to Raul for introductions. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Raul Mercator. I'm the board president of Families First of Palm Beach County. I will be your moderator today. Uh, we're going to keep this to an hour, uh, and that's going to include questions and answers. So throughout the, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to submit them. Uh, we will have some time left uh, at the end to answer those questions. All right, so please move on to the next slide. So today we have the privilege uh, to have the following panel of speakers from the Palm Beach School District. Barbara McQuinn, School Board Member, District 1. Edward Tierney, Chief of Staff. Claudia Shea, Director of Communications and Engagement. And Dr. Glenda Sheffield, Chief Academic Officer. Next slide, please. So briefly go over the agenda. I'm going to give you a quick overview of who Families First is, how we engage with the community. Uh, then we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves and move right into the panel discussion. And then we'll end with some questions and answers. Next slide. So Families First has been around for about 30 years. Our goal is to give families the tools that they need to be successful. Uh, many of these families, as you can see on the screen, are struggling with domestic violence, homelessness, drug or alcohol abuse, mental or physical health issues. Um, and you can just imagine how those issues have been exacerbated with the COVID pandemic. Uh, so they've really been playing a really big part um, in helping many of the most underserved areas of our community. Next slide. Uh, about five years ago, we created a foundation in order to sustain families first. So we want to grow the endowment. We've started with a legacy, uh, giving society to give donors an opportunity to leave a legacy through families first. If you, if you guys want to learn more, you can visit us at familiesfirstpbc.org. Next slide, please. So now I would like to call on each panelist to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Barbara McQuinn, School Board Member, District 1. Thank you, Raul. I am Barbara McQuinn, School Board Member, District 1, which is North County. Very short introduction. I had a 34-year career with our Palm Beach County School District as a classroom teacher, principal, and area superintendent. And now, after a few years, of leave from employment with the district, I now have the honor of serving um, on the school board. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Next, Ed Tierney, Chief of Staff. Good morning, my name's Ed Tierney, I'm the Chief of Staff. I just finished my 18th year in the school district and uh, I appreciate the invitation this morning and I'm so pleased to be here. Absolutely, thank you for being here. Uh, next, Dr. Glenda Sheffield. Chief Academic Officer. Oh, Glenda, I think you're muted. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, that would help on muting that budding there. <laughs> I'm Glenda Sheffield. I'm the Chief Academic Officer here with the School District of Palm Beach County. I'm actually going into my second year as the Chief Academic Officer and entering um, my 20th year here with this awesome school district, and I'm just excited to be a part of the conversation this morning. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Um, and lastly, Claudia Shea, Director of Communications and Engagement. Good morning, Rule, and I would like to uh, just underscore what uh, Dr. Sheffield just said. We're thrilled to be here today. There's so much important information coming out of the district right now, and it seems like it's changing by the day. As the Director of, of Communications, I oversee the digital and written information, as well as overseeing the district's owned and operated television station. So we're really the conduit between the other folks on this panel and the public. And so our job is to make sure that you get all the information out there in a timely fashion in multiple languages 
and we try to be as comprehensive as possible. Great, awesome. Thank you, Claudia. All right, so let's get straight into it. Let's move on to the panel discussion. So, you know, we've got a uh, series of questions um, that we've gotten from the community. We're going to try to break these down by category. So the first category we're going to talk about are um, questions around instructional options. So to start off, why did the school district decide to postpone school reopening? And can you explain the reasoning behind the delaying uh, of the opening of schools? Um, I'd like to begin with, with Mrs. McQuinn on this one. Thank you. I um, fairly, after this question, we will be turning it over to the people who are the experts in the other areas. But I will tell you that I am the board member who first brought up the recommendation that we postpone our reopening from August 10th. Initially, I asked for the day after Labor Day but knowing that the governor wanted our schools to reopen by August 31st, we came to an agreement and the superintendent was in agreement that we delayed that to August 31st. I want to explain that that was not my idea. We were getting um, emails flying in during the board meeting and a parent suggested that we delay that opening in the hopes that as we got the disease, the virus more under control, that our students would have less time on remote learning. So that was the intent. I just repeated what the parents said. But of course, in the meantime, what that's done, although the district was ready to start with remote learning August 10th, that has given us, what, three more weeks for the district to enter into partnerships with so many organizations to make sure that we have the one-on-one -on -one Chromebooks for every student, even if there are multiple kids in a, in a home. And also, which is huge, to get more uh, internet access for those homes. Because again, if you have more than one student, you're going to need greater speed, et cetera. And I know that Claudia or someone We'll go into more detail about that, but it has given us so much more time to get that ready for our students to be able to effectively uh, work remotely. Also, there was one other thing I, oh, I know what it was. And that was to, again, it was an unintended, but now wonderful opportunity for our teachers to get two additional days of teacher training very specifically to make sure that um, their remote learning experiences with the students are um, much better than they were in the spring when of course no one expected it to continue. So why would you do training on it? So really in terms of the technology and our teacher preparation, this has been a huge gift. Fantastic. Does anybody else wanna add to Barbara's comments? Yes, Ed. Thank you. I would like to add on that. And I think Mrs. McQuinn is just being a little bit modest. The calendar in Palm Beach County can be a touchy subject and, and most people are hesitant to address it unless it's absolutely necessary. But the leadership of the board, particularly led by Mrs. McQuinn, they just insisted that we not open school until we could be sure that all students had access to the internet, had a device, and also would minimize the time and the distance learning. So I just really want to point out how much how much kind of courage that took to address and how much it's benefited in this extra time, the students who might otherwise have been challenged regarding access and accessing distance learning. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Does, does anybody else have any comments? I could add a little bit more about the distance learning and the numbers and how all of that works. So when we went to distance learning, it was a, really a one week pivot and Thank you so much to Dr. Sheffield. She just, they were ready. They were just ready to go. And it might not have been perfect, but it was really admirable how everyone just stepped up. The teachers were, there was already a plan in place should this happen, but they just really just stepped up and executed it well. However, there's always room for improvement. And one of the flaws that we saw and something with any school district is always trying to close the digital divide. And so what going to distance learning really exposed was that about 10% of the kids in our district so that translates to almost 15,000 kids didn't have either connectivity, Wi-Fi, or a computer in the home. So within weeks, the district was able to distribute about 62,000 laptops 
And um, the connectivity we've worked on ever since, I mean, really went into overdrive over the summer. So, so many really cool things happened and so many wonderful partners stepped up. Comcast was first out of the gate. You know, they just started offering that this, the essentials program and anyone who's still looking for connectivity, it's Comcast Essentials. So they just made free and low cost Wi-Fi available. Since then, Florida Power and Light has joined us. We have an interlocal agreement with the county. If you drive by our districts, you'll see these really tall communications poles on there. They're not cell phones. They're communication poles that we used to use to transmit um, microwave signals into the school so they could get NASA Select and other educational programming. That's no longer necessary. So now the county is working with us to put radio equipment on these poles. And so the signal is actually coming out of different uh, campuses and, and sending free Wi-Fi into those communities. And what happens is the kids at need are going to be getting passwords, you know, as soon as school starts. And so we're going to expand that program initially from three campuses to more than 60. In addition to that, business partners have donated so many hotspots. So where we had maybe 15,000 kids who didn't have all of this, we anticipate that by the time school starts, that we'll have enough of all of this for 20,000 more kids. We're also distributing 80,000 more laptops, which has been a challenge because there's a global shortage. But we're uh, starting on the 17th to uh, distribute an extra 10,000 a week. So we feel like we're in really good shape. And thank you to Mrs. McQuinn and the entire board for that extra time, because we would have been close, but now we're almost certain we're gonna be there. And then Dr. Sheffield, I mean, she's just had this wonderful opportunity with those two extra personal development days for the teachers. That's great. That is great. Dr. Sheffield, do you have any comments? No, um, I think my team, they, for that particular one, they really covered all of the important pieces. I think we will get into talking a little later um, in this conversation around how different um, this distance learning is going to look when we start on August 31st compared to when we, you know, had to, of course, leave brick and mortar on March 13th. Perfect. Perfect. So here's a quick question. So where can parents find more information? Apart from, I mean, you guys gave a great explanation, but if they want to refer back, where can they get more information about where the district is um, in its planning and decisions already made? Well, we have such a large and diverse and just geographically enormous district. And so uh, we have a lot of people speaking various languages. So uh, the communication department makes an effort to every piece of information we put out, we put out in multiple languages. So everything automatically goes out in English, Spanish, Haitian, Creole. We also are increasing to put information out in Portuguese as well. The, the clearinghouse for all of this information is palmbeachschools.org. And I would encourage parents and the community to go on there as often as possible because that information is literally being updated every single day. And on there, you'll find everything from where feeding sites are located. We're up to 134 feeding sites right now. Uh, information about um, mental health support, which is still going on in the summer. Uh, everything that you could possibly imagine or want is on there, as well as on the district's mobile app, which is available uh, you know, for, uh, for any kind of smartphone. It's a free app, just download that. In addition to that, uh, communication sends out four uh, electronic newsletters a week in various languages and also one geared towards the business community and one for parents. And then we're all over our social media, uh, Twitter. I would encourage everyone to follow Superintendent Fenoy on Twitter. And that's how you really, really will stay up to date to all of this information. And one really important thing you'll find on there is if you click on the school board icon, you'll see all of the school board meetings that have been archived or during school board days, we have a meeting coming up this Wednesday, you can watch live. Fantastic. Seems that there's a lot of information there and great information to be had. Um, so moving on. So why did the district uh, decide not to give parents an option for in-school learning? Ms. McQuinn, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, I, I was going to do that and I'll and then I'll let um, Mr. Cherney take over from there. Initially, um, when a Dr. Fenoy staff brought the reopening plan to us that had to be submitted to the Department of Education for approval, we were 
the, the uh, metrics were not such that we could bring our students back to bricks and mortar on, on August 10th. So the plan they brought was that, and I'm looking at the question again, was that we began with no choice. It had to be remote, strictly based on the safety metrics for bringing all of those children into a school and teachers all at one time. I'm very excited, and then I will let them take over. I am very excited when Dr. Fenoy called each board member individually Monday and said, we're revising the plan in response to his conversations with um, state people, but also in response to many of the parents who emailed immediately, I think it was July 19th when we approved that first plan, um, that was we, we were bringing them back first grade and kindergarten, sixth grade, um, I have this, and ninth grade, many parents, I've just given an example, said, no, my seniors need to come back to school. So in the district analyzing all of those responses, it was, a win, in my, I call it a win-win because we'll open schools when it's safe to do so, but when we do so, it's parent choice. Turning it over. So I think I'd answer that question that, that our plan is built entirely around parent choice. Once the county moves into phase two and it's safe to bring back both students and teachers and support staff. So, you know, as Ms. McQuinn said, based on feedback from the Department of Education, parental feedback, and then really strong feelings from board members, particularly Mrs. McQuinn on parental choice. It is built around parents being able to choose what's best for their child once we move into phase two and circumstances allow us to come back. And that was something that parents were confused about initially when they first heard about this. They thought, maybe because of some headlines in the newspaper, that once we shift over to phase two, that all the kids had to go back to brick and mortar, and that's not the case at all. So those parents who want to keep their children home and continue in distance learning can continue to do so. So, you know, any comments around, you know, what you would say to parents who believe that they should be given that choice between sending their child to school or having to attend school from their homes? I, one more thing to add, of course, they all know me on the Families First Board, um, <laughs> is that at this upcoming, our board meeting this next Wednesday, I apologize, I don't have the date in my head, but we're meeting this next Wednesday and the following Wednesday, and um, the superintendent is bringing the board policies around how students return, um, how our employees return, and all of the safety guidelines around that. So we have those two policies that are very specific and the staff has already gone through, um, through all of those with the board members. So we're ready, we should be totally ready for the public on Wednesday. And then finally, that last Wednesday, before we actually begin virtual learning, the, there will be a good board discussion about any questions, and we'll get a lot from the public. Um, again, I'm 1,400 emails and counting still, but we will get into the real nitty gritty of parents' questions, because how do I, as a parent, say, I'm coming, I want my child to come back, but tell me what that looks like. What does it look like on the streets? What does it look like in terms of a mask? I guarantee you by the time we open our doors virtually, much less in person, we'll have all of the answers to those questions. Fantastic. So, you know, kind of segueing into that, I mean, will, will remote learning be identical to the distance learning that all of us experienced in the final months of last school year? Well, surely I will um, have to say that absolutely not. And if this distance learning platform, and when we start on August 31st, looked the same that it looked when we went, when we left Brook and Mortar on March 13th, then shame on us as a district. So I can say to you that the team and the staff have worked very hard this summer in regarding to making certain that we build a platform and prepared for such um, to where we had to open up in this space that it looked very much different around the instructional component as it pertains to the delivery 
and the expectations um, for our teachers and for our students. And we know that nothing will replace our students being in brick and mortar, but we must prepare for the space in which we're currently in. So what we really spent some time with over um, during this summer is that we really spent some time um, listening to um, the feedback from our parents, our students, our teachers, um, and really try to create a robust system that was going to meet the needs of all parties. And a big part of that is developing and collaborating, I should say, um, the relationship with our Classroom Teachers Association, the union. So we are very proud to be starting up on August 34th with an MOU, with a Memorandum of Understanding, which are specific um, expectations around what the instructional day will look not like, not what it should look like, but what it will look like um, from a teacher's perspective in delivering it to our students. And so it all comes around in terms of accountability. You know, we all need to be held accountable. So when we're holding ourselves accountable, you know, from the adult learners aspect, then there's going to be some accountability from the student's perspective as well. So some of that I should say is that all schools, um, all teachers will be following the district scope and sequence that is all tied to state standards. And what when we talk about um, the district scope and sequence, um, it is something that we're holding tight um, because we've also developed the standards based assessments in which we would be utilizing to assist us to inform teaching and learning as our students are navigating through this. Um, it is important that we make certain that those standards were all tied and there were all all of those assessments were tied to standards and we worked hard with that over the summer that's why we're saying that we are holding it tight everyone will be utilizing the scope and sequence and another reason for holding tight the scope and sequence um, and utilizing those formative and summative assessments to gauge students um, performance level is that we know that there are going to be some gaps in regards to, you know, we talk about the summer slide with our student learning. Now we have this COVID-19 slide. So what we have done as a district is that we took those standards that were covered, um, the, covered the last nine weeks, the last marking period, and we've embedded those standards into our current scope and sequence. So we are trying to also make certain, and of course, being conscious and not being afraid to say that, there were no slides because we know there are slides. So we are, and that's a way for us gauging and just making certain that we are being more attentive. So along with, you know, the scope and sequence, the standards-based instruction, all teachers will be providing um, live Google instruction, Google Meets, all teachers will be going live. Um, the classes will be recorded. Now, because we are recording our instruction, that is not replacing um, to where students are saying that they are able to log on at any time to to go back and see the teacher's recorded lesson. That's not the op that's not the reason for recording the lesson. The reason that um, we're recording the lesson is that a students needing a family needing to go back for some form of remediation or enrichment or there were an extenuating circumstances that we have that available for our families. But the expectations from our students because of the expectations that we now have set forth from the instructional standpoint from the adult learners, our teachers, is that our students are going to be going live every period, say if you're in secondary, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever period it is, you're going to be logging on, you're going to be participating in that live instructional component. Our elementary students work on, you know, their schedules on a daily schedule. So they will be logging on and having live, Google Live, during that instructional time with their teachers. Now, also with that, we've worked and Google have worked with us a lot in regards to some of the um, features that they did not have available in their platform because no one saw this space. And so some of the some of these initiatives in which Google has worked with us on is in regards to teachers are still going to be able to provide their small group instruction. Um, you know, our paraprofessionals that tend to work with our teachers and our students in some instances are going to be able to log into those Google classrooms, set up those Google small group instructions within that Google classrooms, just being more intensive, being more engaged and 
and, and, and trying to ensure, again, that instructional um, pedagogy and just holding tight in this current space in which we are in. So the expectation is that we're going to be operating our distance learning platform and as if we were in that brick and mortar on a regular school day schedule because we're receiving FTE for those seat times and for all those pieces, but just take all of that out the place. It's just that we're developing a more structured, robust system. Um, and you know, I could go on and on in terms of just talking about how different that will look but that's the biggest piece for me, is being able to work with the teachers union to create and have that memorandum of understanding in regards to how robust the instructional delivery from the instructional standpoint from the adult learner is going to look compared to what it looked like when we ended in March. And that's a piece that we did not have in place. We did not have that in place. So we had to, we did our very best in regards to what we could have expected from our teachers. Now we've worked with the teachers, we've worked with the unions, and now it's where no one have to second guess in regards to what is expected of me. I know what is expected of me. I'm committed to this work in this space and I have it all laid out. That's, that's, that's great information. That's a lot of information. So you answered a lot of questions there. I've got a couple of follow-up for you, though, uh, building on what you just stated. So, you know, how are students going to take district assessments and tests created by the teachers remotely? And listen, these are unprecedented times. Everybody's online. How are we going to be dealing with logistical challenges of distance learning? Well, and you know, and I talked about those, you know, those formative assessments that we have built in, and we all know assessments are used to inform teaching and learning. So because of how we're use, utilizing our assessments, it's not used in terms of um, a punitive way, it's to assist us engaging where our students are so that we can develop that instructional piece to help close those gaps. So we, um, we're saying to our students and to our families, is that and as the teachers will continue to navigate through this with them, when they have their live Google Meet open house, you know, with the families and so forth, is to talk about academic integrity, academic honesty, um, and how important it is within this space. And that's what we would have to, um, that's what we would have to depend on, you know, with that, because um, that's the only way we're going to be able to truly, as a system, provide and meet our students where they are um, and develop those unique opportunities for them and those robust remediation or enrichment opportunities for them based on their academic performance with them being having, and I should say, with, it ha with them having that honesty and that integrity in when they're participating within these assessments. Because that's what assessments are used for, is to inform teaching and learning. It's not punitive. Got it. Got it. Great. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit. First, Dr. Sheffield's really done an incredible job having district staff, school-based administrators, and teachers singularly focused on student success. But then the school board's constant mandate to the superintendent and staff has been First, find every student, because not every student logged in last year as frequently as we would have liked. So the mandate has been to find every student and then identify students where distance learning didn't work as well as we would have liked last semester. So identify the students who had a gap and then remediate them and accelerate their learning this year so that gap is closed as quickly as possible. I don't want to belabor this piece about the testing, although I'm putting a big star by the, on, my, on my paper here. Both Dr. Sheffield and Mr. Tierney and myself have been high school principals. And at all level, I mean, we know that we have parents um, who want their children to be um, at the top of their class. There are many who want that. And we very often determine that through grades, that we very often determine through testing. It's going to be a challenge, and the academic integrity that Dr. Sheffield talked about is big. But frankly, um, we know what happens in colleges and universities with 
test taking issues. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna have to look as a district perhaps in how we rank students during this time because I wish that I could say that everyone, well, my grandson said, Grandma, could you help me with this math? I had to say, this is last spring, nope, I can't, um, you know, <laughs> because you want them to do well. And, and so for me, this is going to be a big issue when we're talking about testing and relating it to class rank. And we can't solve that problem now, but as a board member to district staff, um, I know that that is going to become a big deal to deal with. That's great. I'm, and you know what? Um, as you guys are speaking, I'm also monitoring some of the questions that are coming through. And I think this one's somewhat related, so I just want to throw it in and, and just get the attendees involved. So I've got a question here that says, the panelists stated that the computers are going to start being distributed on August 17th. Will they be, uh, will they be talking about uh, more, excuse me, will they be talking about more uh, about how that will look what do parents who have multiple children need to do to get a computer for each of their school age children? So that's going to be handled on a yes, school well. by school basis and we're starting with the students in greatest need to be fair. And so though we do have a lot, so we have uh, almost 200,000 students in our district. So you have to remember that. So we have enough for all the kids who need them. So one thing I would caution people, if you have, enough computers in your house, don't sign up and say, I need another one because you'll maybe be taking one out of the hands of a child who does. But uh, that aside, the principals are gonna be doing this on a school by school basis, and they're gonna be reaching out to their parents and letting them know what the distribution dates are. And then something else that's really important, we did this when we closed in the spring, we're opening a phone bank, the district's opening a phone bank in multiple languages on August 19th. And parents with any questions, if they didn't, you know, get the answer they needed from the school or whatever, can just call in and we'll handle all of that. All the logistics are being worked out on the school by school levels. And um, one more piece about that, because I know this is in response to that question. Um, I happen to have asked uh, Dr. Ionetti, who's principal at Jupiter High School that we know is huge, like over 3,000 students. I said, just give me a feel for how you're handling all of that. And I'm literally, reading her response. Number one, I, I first of all look at the district, but then go to the individual school website because, you know, she said here, we're going to, each individual school may have a different um, date for doing things. So, for example, at Jupiter High, they want you to make sure, and this is district-wide, make sure that the school has current information, email, phone, etc. That's huge for them to contact you if they don't hear from you. But for example, at Jupiter High, they're going to start distributing textbooks August 24th by grade level alpha. That's just an example of the kind of information that you will get from individual schools. So know that the principals are ready. And it would be a drive through Fantastic. So everyone's socially distant. Yeah. We'll have, it'll be drive through just like we've been doing with our grab and go meals. So there won't be physical contact. But people, as Mrs. McQueen said, everyone should wait until they're notified by their school for the devices. Good point. Don't just show up. Don't You'll show be notified up. by the school, by grade, by alpha. Okay. <laughs> Can I say one more thing about the devices that's different this year? And I just learned this a couple of days ago. So, in the spring rather. So when the devices were distributed in the spring, a computer was pretty much a computer. Mom and dad could log on to the district computer and go to their work website. The, uh, the devices have been reconfigured to be purposefully, uh, they're there for education. So kids, for example, won't be able to go to social media sites on the district computers now. It's basically so you can log into your classroom, you can do your homework, you can take your tests, you can go to the YouTube links that your teacher assigns, but you can't go to any of these sites that you really shouldn't be visiting anyway. Thank you, Claudia. And here's a follow-up question. So I'm trying to integrate some of these questions from the attendees. Will the Chromebooks be loaded with software slash programs that we will not able to access with a personal computer? It will be. I think so, no? Well, no. I mean, well, the Chromebook and the devices in which your students will receive 
it will have all the applicable softwares that they would need for the for instructional purposes. Those will be the only software applications that will be available to them. But what Very about good. students who are using their own computers from home instead of our Chromebooks? Well, when they are logging in with their um, with their student number to the district portal, that's how they will receive access from their personal computer. It's their district sign-on is taking them through the district portal for their student portal. Thank you. All right. So I'm looking at the clock right now. It's 1137. So we are going to be moving to a next category, which I believe is really important. It's been a very hot topic, which is mental wellness. So, you know, a lot of kids, I know my nephew, uh, he's had a lot of anxiety, um, just this whole situation and, and just coming back or staying, you know, uh, learning from home. So if a child is anxious or concerned about distance learning, what will the district do to help? Well, I could tell you, and I'm sure, you know, that um, has been a concern um, as it pertains to the social and emotional well-being of not just our students, but our teachers, I mean, all district employees, and even our families. And when we went into brick and mortar back in March, um, a big plea for myself was that, can we please find a way to continue to provide the mental health services and the support from our mental health professionals that were in all of our schools and our behavior health professionals. Because we realized that this was going to be something new, some, an experience that our students had never experienced and the parents as it pertains to immediately losing that connection that they had with their teachers, um, you know, their friends um, and so forth. So we were able to just continue providing those services for those students that were already in the pipeline that were receiving um, services um, as clients from our behavioral health professionals and our mental health professionals on all of our campuses. That continued throughout the summer. We never stopped there. And we're going to, um, it's going to continue just as if we were in brick and mortar. And any families, and I can say in what we found that we were not just supporting our students um, in this virtual space. We found to where there were families, you know, um, mom, dad, aunt, or whomever that were also needing some support in terms of just navigating um, and how they were feeling. And we were just, we were blessed to just include and create some form of a group family counseling, um, if you may. So we are, will be providing those same kind of services. And I will say that for any student, any family, any district staff that are having that angst or some form of an anxiety or are feeling um, some kind of way and needing some assistance, for them to reach out um, to, you know, the school principals, um, you know, the guidance counselors or what have you. But in this current space, as prior to August 13th, excuse me, August 34th, excuse me, August 31st, I would say it would be best to reach out to the school principal. Okay, and is there any other resources that a parent can find information regarding emotional and uh, mental wellness for their child? Yes, I mean, Claudia, you may want to talk about, Claudia, the resources that we have, um, you know, there um, with on our student wellness pages, because we do have a lot of resources around the SEL um, support services. And right now we're open, we're closed on Fridays uh, for another week, but uh, Monday through Thursday right now, anyone who would like to call again, go to the website, palmbeachschools.org, and you'll see a number there to call for mental health support. Of course, when we're not there, 211 is also a great resource that we work very closely with uh, the 211 operators. But there are many activities also on our website as it pertains to mental health. Uh, do you need help with your young children explaining to them what COVID is? And you know, all of this because to a little kid, they see this nonstop on the news and they think it's enormous. They think it's the whole world. And um, so we, we do have lessons on there from the littlest children all the way up through high school. And then as Dr. Sheffield said, also parental support. So I'd really encourage people to take a quick look at that. And then it is important too, that when you talk in regards to how different um, this distance learning is going to look, um, the SEL, um, that's a non-negotiable, that's built into our daily um, instructional piece for all grade, ele for elementary and secondary students. So SEL, social yeah. emotional um, learning, uh, S-E-L, yeah. Uh, but I also have to put in a plug here for Families First because if you 
all the board members sit on various nonprofits, et cetera, in the district. And my very first um, one was to be uh, appointed to serve on the family's first board, which they all know is very dear to my heart. And Families First does partner with the school district and we do have um, in various locations um, and in some schools, we do have therapists who very specifically work with the students and their families on this before COVID and now certainly working with them. So that's a huge role. Um, kudos to Families First for that. That's a great point, Barbara. And yeah, I mean, that, that's a great uh, point of access uh, for children, for counseling and other support services. So I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, will, you know, any of the other staff receive any extra training regarding trauma-informed care uh, and mental health first aid as a result of COVID-19? I think I'd just add that, that uh, really since March of, of last semester, you know, the superintendent has regularly said that we're, when we bring them back, we're going to have to focus on the social emotional learning first and make sure they're emotionally available to learn prior to. So it, it has been a refrain throughout the spring and summer that we support the students emotionally before we, before we expect them to access the learning. So I think we have really the whole district staff focused on the realization that, you know, this was more difficult on some than others and we're going to have to support them emotionally and help them get prepared to resume school once we start. And it's also a big, it's also a bucket piece of the um, training in which our teachers are participating in, in regards to what that SEL um, work should look like and will look like um, as they start the year. So our teachers are, and we find, you know, we are taking an assertive effort to make certain that we include that into the ongoing trainings and so forth that we are doing with our teachers. Fantastic. So we've got about 17 minutes left right now. So I'm going to pivot very quickly to another very important category or subject, food and nutrition. So what will students still have to access? Uh, will they still have access, excuse me, to free or reduced price meals? And how is that going to work? So students have been receiving free meals, any student in need, regardless of financial uh, need have been available to pick up these grab-and-go meals where you drive in and you pick up the food on designated days of the week. Again, I would encourage people to go back to our website to see what those are. We recently jumped from 52 feeding sites to 134, and we're going to keep up those 134 as long as we maneuver through distance learning, because it's important to feed, you know, the mind and the body of our children. And we have so many Title I schools, which means, of course, uh, parents living in poverty, and a lot of these kids depend on maybe their only meal of the day from the school. So the school board, Mrs. McQuinn and uh, Dr. Fernoy were very, very clear on that. We're not gonna miss a beat. So on certain weeks, we may feed kids on two days, but those kids on those two days pick up enough meals for the entire week. Great. And to, and again, just thinking about time, I'm going to pivot very quickly. And we've already done a lot of speaking on this, but there are a lot of attendee questions uh, centered around it as I'm, I'm checking out the chat box. So it's around technology. So we'll start off with this. If parents currently do not have a computer or internet access, how can they obtain one from the district? Um, and how can they contact um, if they do not have computers for their kids? Um, if you can just, um, Go back to that a little bit. I know we, we already discussed it a tiny bit, but really reiterate that for everyone. So the best thing to do is wait for your school to reach out to you. And if you haven't heard from your school, you know, as we're leading up to the days, you know, just before the start of school, then I would contact your principal directly. Another issue that we had when we pivoted to distance learning in the spring, when kids did get these computers, you have to remember for a lot of families, there was no computer in the house whatsoever. And so a lot of parents or grandparents, guardians watching these kids had never even logged on. So we have a, an IT service desk. That number is also on the, on the district website. So we anticipate that, that people are going to have continuing challenges with computers until we get this up and running. But you know, the big piece as far as how to receive a computer is you really should wait for your principal to reach out for you. I saw one of the questions was about charter schools. 
The charter schools will be handling their own devices directly. These are our district operated public schools that we're distributing the computers to. Great, thank you. And let me ask you this. I mean, you make a great point. A lot of these households don't even have a computer. God knows they probably don't have a household modem. So what is the district's plan for households without a modem? Well, they're built into the computers. So as long as you have that Wi-Fi available, you'll be good. And again, we've made so many inroads in providing the Wi-Fi. And it will only get better over the course of the year. And then one thing that Dr. Fenoy has been uh, very verbal about, and I think it's just a really great point, distance learning is never going away. So even when we get out of this pandemic and we go back to school, distance learning is going to be our reality moving forward from what if we have a hurricane and then you get your electricity back in certain pockets. Those kids can now just do distance learning all the way down to what if a kid's suspended, an out of school suspension? Well, before that child would just sit home and that's it. No academics. Well, mm -hmm. now with distance learning, you'll have a computer in that child's home so they can continue with their instruction while they're at home. So there's just so many great needs for this. And it's so, I think it's a, a tremendous, if there's a silver lining in all of this, and I know that all of us are waiting for something wonderful to happen like a vaccine, but if there's a silver lining in all of this, I do think it's that we're making inroads to close the digital divide. I mean, we have just more, uh, so many more people are now computer savvy. So many more people are now connected to the internet. And I think that that goes back to what this school board stands for. It's equity and access for every single student. And that's our goal at the end of the day. No, you make a great point because I mean, this is where everything was going eventually. This COVID situation just accelerated everything and just you know put it on steroids. So yeah, this is gonna be part of our reality moving forward, uh, regardless um, of how quickly we solve the COVID pandemic. Um, but you know, to that point, you know, as a parent, um, how can they prepare their child for distance learning? Any, any thoughts on that? I just wanna go back to the, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've talked a lot about handing out the computers and I think that's fairly clear, but there are a lot of parents with no internet access or substandard internet access that would not support it. And, and I think the question was, what, what do they do? The likelihood is we've already identified them. We've really studied last semester and, and the, the metric we used was students who do not log in two or more times per week. So we've identified the families and we're confident that we have all of them who have no access to internet access or, or access that will not support it. And we've partnered with Palm Beach County to initiate a large scale municipal solution using up to $10 million in CARE Act. And the project that we expect to be completed in late 2020 across Palm Beach County is gonna provide internet access for more than 20,000 students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. That's starting in the Glades, Lake Worth Beach, and then we're just gonna move throughout the county. But there's been incredible support from the county, both the business sector and the governmental sector on supporting our students who are really making a lot of progress on that. Thank you, Ed. So yeah, so again, coming back to a uh, question I asked as a parent, so how, what are the things, top three things that I could do to prepare my child for distance learning? Well, I will start and you know, my team definitely chime in, but for me, it will be as a parent um, because you know, we're gonna make certain that we push those pieces out, the training components um, as it pertains to, to help parents navigate through you know, the Google Meet, through the platforms and so forth, or what have you, right? But from my standpoint will be to, of course, assist us in identifying you know, that quiet space um, in your home for your child to have an opportunity to work and to just spend some time in talking with your child as it pertains to why we are in this current space and the need for us to be um, more attentive and how we have to work in our current space and that eventually our goal is to get back into brick and mortar. So in that meaning in regards to you're in school, it's just in a different space and this is the why. And so it's going to, it's going to you're in your home, you're in school, we're gonna be following that daily school schedule and your teacher is going to be in that distance environment. And, and just trying to help this child navigate through those pieces. And many times we think that it's um, the elementary students that's going to have more of a challenge, more of difficulty there. But our secondary students have challenges um, in that space as well. 
So, and that's from the parents' perspective, you know, in terms of what the parents can do to assist us. And then just working collaboratively, you know, with the teacher, um, you know, with the principal, um, and as with the district. I think this space is going to take everyone um, coming together and just navigating in this new space. And I don't want to say until we get back to our normalcy, because I don't think we will ever go back to being normal. Um, but we definitely want to go back into that space of being in brick and mortar. So those were my top three in regards to what I foresee what parents can do right now to assist in terms of navigating through this. And I don't think that I, I don't recall if I said um, at the very beginning of the conversation when we we're talking about how different this space will look and we were talking so much around, you know, the scope and sequence, having that MOU with the union and the expectations and the non-negotiables and so forth. Um, but teachers are also going to be having what is called, um, you know, still their office hours and so forth to where parents can have that one-on-one -on -one time they're with their teachers. And we realize that our parents are, many of them are still working and they're probably saying, well, how am I going to do office hours when I am at work? Again, we understand those extenuating circumstances. And that's why we say it's definitely going to take a village and it's all working together. So it's that collaboration, it's that ongoing conversation with all parties that's going to help take down that wall um, and bring those pieces together. Fantastic. And we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, and I apologize. I just want to be able to ask these two other questions because there's some great points being made. And ultimately, even though we're in distance learning right now, ultimately, we are going to be doing some type of transition um, into brick and mortar. So, you know, one of the big questions parents have and, and the community is, what is the district doing or have been doing to prepare schools and buses for the eventual return of students? And I think that's what Ms. McQuinn talked about earlier and I'm sure, Barbara, you're ready to jump in there, that our next two board meetings is around in regards to what the operational piece is looking like and what we're doing now and how we are preparing to return to brick and mortar. So I'll go ahead and let the team, but I can assure you um, there is a lot of work that are currently taking place as we speak as it pertains to getting ready to return to brick and mortar. I can tell you, um, I have an update from um, Mrs. Paul, our chief operating officer, who's in charge of food, buses, all of that, buildings. And I will tell you that if our students, if, if the virus were such that they could come back today, our facilities would be ready because we have had staff, custodial staff, maintenance staff in getting them ready. Um, but in terms of when students return, they are receiving ongoing training about um, how they clean um, between, maybe the students have been to lunch or whatever that looks like, it's gonna work out. But there is a much, um, there's a schedule for additional training. Our, our school buses, the district has purchased, um, I'm not gonna get this right, some big spraying machines to disinfect the buses. <laughs> Of course, they'll have to do that in between. They've ordered the plastic shields. They've ordered individual student masks. So I will tell you that in terms of opening schools physically, not how we do it in terms of separating the students, but the physical pieces that need to be in place are in place. So, oh, except maybe Fantastic. air filters. I don't know about that. Got it. Got it. All right. So one last uh, question that I have here. Um, a lot of us on this call, uh, I believe, are from the business community. Uh, we want to help. We want to support. So how can the business community support the school district? I can jump in there just to start. Dr. Fernoy, when he made the announcement that the district was shifting to distance learning, he, he lost sleep over the fact that we have working parents who now are gonna be in a pickle. What do I do with my children when I go to work? And so he made an appeal at that point for uh, business and community leaders to be flexible. So if your employee has a job that can be done from home, consider the, that, consider that, consider being flexible with that parent. And if you have a space in your office where a child can come into the office and be socially distant from other people, consider doing that. You know, as Dr. Sheffield said, it takes a village. And I think that the school district is so used to 
having people come to us saying, what are you doing about this? And what are you doing about that? And in something like this, this is something the world has never experienced. We all have to come together. And uh, we're leading by example. Uh, Dr. Fenoy made an announcement a few days ago to our teachers and our administrators, school-based administrators. You know, one of the goals is to try to get teachers to teach from the classroom, even in distance learning. So you have that normalcy. So under, uh, you know, certain situations and where he can be sure that kids are gonna be socially distanced, he is allowing teachers and other staff at the school to bring their children to the school. Again, leading by example, and I would really encourage any business that's listening right now to consider to do the same. Again, we all have to play our part. We have to go back to old fashioned, you know, the neighborhoods and helping each other. And if you're a stay at home parent and you have one child and you have room where they can be socially distant, is there taking another child at your home? Again, for this to really work at its best, we all have to come together. And just one more thing I wanted to say on that is that being in the communications, I see all of the comments coming in on social media and there are so many negative comments. It's just, and you know, we, that's fine until you do it in front of your kids. And so you have to set your kids up for success. And if you say in front of your children, oh, distance learning didn't work very well in the spring, so you're not gonna learn anything now, of course you're not, because you're gonna set your child up for, for failure. So give it a chance. I mean, Dr. Sheffield and her team have worked so hard. So I would encourage all parents, be neighborly, give it a chance, help your child, encourage them. And, you know, this is the best we can do. We're just trying to keep people safe and have them learn at the same time. Fantastic. Thank you, Claudia. And there's a lot of questions that I'm looking, great questions that I'm seeing here from the attendees, but I'm also looking at the clock and I want to be very respectful of everyone's time. So it's about 11.58 right now. So I just first want to just thank um, all the panelists today for taking the time to be on here and, and you know, providing this information and, um, you know, supporting families first. Um, you know, this, all the information has been very insightful. I think it's been very complete. Um, you know, we will be sending out updates on any information as it arrives for those attendees. Uh, you can always log on to the Palm Beach County District website for all new updates and all the other different uh, websites and social media that was mentioned. Uh, I believe the school district doing a great job in getting that, getting that information out there. Um, we'll do one last plug for families first. Please save the date for our upcoming Children's Day Luncheon. It's October 2nd. It's our 14th annual luncheon. This is our big to do. We usually had it at the Kravitz Center. Last time we had over 400 people there. It's a different world right now. We're gonna be doing it virtually. Registrations are free. So please looking out for that. And again, that's October 2nd. And um, with that, I just wanna thank everyone on this call. Thank you, Castle Group. Um, and thank you, Families First. Uh, everyone stay safe. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you very much.